What's up webheads, I'm Steven from the Hills Maniacs, and today I'm going to be continuing my series of reviews on every live action Spider-Man movie. Uh, in the last video, which came up yesterday, I talked about the first of the Tom Holland Spider or MCU Spider-Man movies, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Now today I'm going to be continuing with Spider-Man Far From Home. So I said in my last video how I didn't like that they included Tony Stark too much in that movie. Like, I felt like they he was involved in that movie, like, way too much. And it kind of took away from, you know, it being all about Peter Parker and Spider-Man and everything else. I, I said my piece on that. Go check out, what, like, the rest of what I said in my Spider-Man Homecoming review if you haven't seen that yet. Um... But in this one, I feel like it worked out okay. I like how they tied this into Endgame and, every, and and a lot of other stuff that's happened in the past with M the MCU. Like, they did still include stuff, include things in this movie that had to do with Tony Stark. Like, Tony gives Peter the, or basically willed Peter the Edith glasses, which are like, control these Stark drones that are out in space. Which would have really helped in Endgame, honestly. Um... So that's kind of, that involves Tony Stark a lot, and then you, we find out in this movie, you know, that Mysterio, Quentin Beck, was actually a former employee of Tony's who he fired and basically stole his technology and his ideas and everything else. So there was still Tony Stark involvement in this, but because this is after Endgame and Tony Stark was dead, rest in peace Tony Stark, you know, for saving the universe and everything else that he did in Endgame, but I'm glad that they didn't decide to include another hero in this to kind of help Peter. Like, Happy Hogan was in this, and Nick Fury was in this as well, but it made sense why they were in this. They weren't helping Peter. They were trying to... Like, Nick Fury was trying to get a hold of Peter because he needed his help with something because a lot of the other Avengers were busy or off-world or whatever, so, like, Peter was the only one available, and it was also because Nick Fury needed to be the one to give him... Uh, the Edith glasses, which Tony Stark, lent, you know, left him. I like that they kind of went the opposite of what they did in the previous movie, where, like, all Peter wanted in the first movie, in Homecoming, was to be a hero. Like, he wanted to be recruited by Tony Stark again. He wanted to do something Avengers-like, because he was told he's an Avenger. So, like, he wanted to be a hero in the first one. He wanted to be an Avenger, and, like, nobody would call him. Tony Stark wouldn't get back to him and everything else, and he ends up kind of basically helping with that and getting Tony's attention where Tony like now wants to recruit him to the Avengers and we see that he does get recruited in Infinity War you know but in this one they went the opposite of that where like all Peter wants is to be a normal kid because this is following him coming back from the blip you know after Endgame and like being snapped back into existence with half of everyone else in the universe um, so he just wants to be a normal kid, go on his class trip. He's trying to start a relationship with MJ, which we've seen in the past, you know, Spider-Man movies and things like that. But it's a different adaptation of Mary Jane in this case. But Pete, so all Peter wants to be is a normal kid in this one, and he ends up getting roped into what's everything that's going on because Nick Fury tries to get his attention by calling him, and when he ignores him, now Nick Fury basically hijacks his vacation. And, like, makes him go where he needs him to be. Like, he, um, I don't know how he did it exactly, but he kind of, like, made their trip change course to where they were actually going on this field trip. Um, but it's Nick Fury, so who knows. So, like, Peter kind of gets roped into all this, and he does. He didn't even want to bring his suit, but his Aunt May, like, snuck it into his suitcase and thought he forgot it, you know, but he didn't want to be a hero in this movie. He just wanted to be a normal kid and still ends up having to, like, save the world basically anyways, you know, because this all, all this Mysterio stuff is going on. And I like that it kind of reminded me of, like, the original Spider-Man 2 where, like, he realized that his life is starting to fall apart because he's Spider-Man, so he doesn't want to be Spider-Man anymore. So there's, like, a parallel there as well. So I kind of like that they did that. And yeah, this movie, like I said, didn't feature too much with other heroes. It did feel more like a Spider-Man movie this time around. Because we got to see Peter's struggles with, you know, trying to live his normal life. Just being a normal high school kid and everything else. Which is really what we needed to see in the first one. Like I said this in my Homecoming review. 
I said how they should have just had it be an origin story that takes place before Civil War instead of after Civil War and, like, remove Tony Stark from it and everything else and just have it be a solo Spider-Man film. So, yeah, so this one made, made more sense to include other, he or include, like, Nick Fury without, he didn't, like, overshadow Peter kind of like Tony Stark did in the first one, you know. This felt more like a Spider-Man movie. And he had to deal with the things going on in this movie, even though he didn't want to. And then he kind of learns that that's kind of what he has to do as a hero. My favorite part of this movie, though, was the end, one of the end credit scenes where Quentin Beck, or Mysterio, after Peter defeats him in London and everything else, and he basically dies. We're not really sure. It's left up in the air if he's actually dead or not. But he creates a video, or creates footage of Peter basically killing him and releasing the drones on the world that they were using and everything else. So it's doctored footage. It makes Pe it makes Spider-Man look like a killer. But then after that, he also reveals uh, who Spider-Man really is, Peter Parker, to the whole world and shows his face on a screen. He sent it to like the Daily Bugle with the return of J. Jonah Jameson, played by J.K. Simmons, which I remember that shocked me when I was watching it for the first time in theaters. So now the whole world knows Peter's identity, and I like that they went that route because we've never seen that in a Spider-Man movie before, and that kind of left us wondering, what is Peter going to do? How is he going to get out of this? Because not only does the world know who Spider-Man is and his secret identity, but they also know, or they also think he's a murderer and a killer, and he released these drones on the world and everything else. So Mysterio is... Can, this lingering villain basically now even though if he is really dead the the aftermath of the fight with Mysterio and his technology and everything else is still lingering in Peter's world in the universe and everything else and that's what leads him to have to as we saw in the trailer for No Way Home go to Doctor Strange to try and get help for this like he wants Doctor Strange to erase everybody's memories of this happening so that they don't remember that he's Spider-Man or that he's a killer. And of course everything goes awry as we've seen in the trailers for that. But I like that they were daring enough to... Like, the MCU was daring enough to go this route with revealing Peter's identity to the world. Because to Peter Parker, that is a big deal. Because if everybody knows who he is, then everybody will come after him and his loved ones and the people he cares about and everything else. And he cares about them so much where he keeps his identity a secret from them so that they aren't put in danger. But we always see in Spider-Man movies, you know, they are put in danger no matter what. Or the villain somehow does find out who Peter Parker is, that, that he is Spider-Man, you know, before the end of the movie. We've seen that in the, you know, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies where the villain finds out right before they die pretty much that they, he is Peter Parker, so they don't live to really tell anybody. So the fact that Mysterio actually tells everybody is is a big deal for this version of Peter Parker, especially with him being a young kid and in high school and everything else. People look up to him. You know, even Flash Thompson, his, his rival, or like his kind of bully in the school that doesn't like Peter Parker, is a fan of Spider-Man's, and now it's like, what's he gonna think? I'm looking forward to seeing in No Way Home kind of how how long into the movie it is before Peter actually goes to Doctor Strange for help. Like, so is it gonna be months before he does, and he just kind of has to live with all these people judging him and everything else? Like, I am looking forward to that. So I feel like they did a nice job of setting up the next movie with that, and that was in the end credits scene, so that was kind of worth waiting for as well. And I also like what they did with Mysterio in this. They didn't just make him straight up like this magic person with superpowers that comes in and everything else. He was trying to make himself look like a hero that's like the best hero this world has ever seen. He's better than the Avengers and they don't need the Avengers anymore and everything else. Because he keeps swooping in and fighting off these elemental monsters. Which we find out later, all of that was faked by this technology that him and his crew have put together. And his crew, or, and him and his crew are all former employees of Stark, of Tony Stark's and Stark Industries, and they've all been disgraced or fired or things like that. Like, we even see Peter Billingsley's character from 
the first Iron Man, you know, the guy that got yelled at by Obadiah Stane to build him an arc reactor, he's in this movie as well, and he's the one that, like, kind of built the drones and, and controls the drones that they use to project the holograms and everything else. I mean, I guess technically that would mean that, like, Quentin Beck and all of them are enemies of Tony Stark's, but the only reason they're enemies of Peter's in this movie is because they want the Edith glasses so that they can create or they can use the drones that Tony Stark built to even further their um, illusions and everything else and make even more explosions and make it look more real than it ever has been before and make him look like a hero that comes in and saves the world from this Avengers-level threat like all by himself, which I guess technically he succeeds in because he makes himself look like the hero at the end with that end credit scene that I mentioned. Because now, like, they, the world thinks that Spider-Man just killed this new guy with these drones. The world thinks that Spider-Man killed him, and now they don't have this new hero. And even J. Jonah Jameson says, like, he may be the greatest superhero this world has ever seen, and Spider-Man killed him. You know, so there you have it, folks, and blah, blah, blah. So I like that they made Mysterio, like, that kind of villain, where he's just trying to prove that he's better than Tony Stark and his technology, and his illusions, and everything else, are so real that even, like, Nick Fury couldn't figure this out at first, you know, and that, that's what the whole point of this was, it was like, he's trying to prove that he's better than Tony Stark, better than the Avengers, he wants the world to believe that he's a hero, and then, of course, you know, so Peter has to stop him, and when he finds out that Peter figures that out, now he has to kill Peter Parker and everything. He has to try and kill Peter Parker and everything else. So that made it a little bit different. And I like that throughout the movie, you know, we're even fooled by his illusions because we don't know what's real and what's not. There's a point where, like, Peter goes to Nick Fury to tell him that he figured out that Quentin Beck, that all this was an illusion and everything else because they found a piece of one of the drones. Um, lying on the ground somewhere, and they, you know, figured out that it has part of an part of the illusion in it. So he go when he goes to Nick Fury to tell him about this that hey, Quentin Beck's a faker, this isn't real, and everything else. It turns out that that's also an illusion. Like Quentin Beck got there first, or whatever, or he brought him to this random warehouse that was abandoned, but they made it look real, and Nick Fury wasn't actually there, and everything. So it was all. Everything we see in that movie, even we're fooled into thinking that something's real and something's not, which made it even better because we don't know what's real. We don't know if Mysterio's actually dead or if he's still out there somewhere ready to put on a new illusion. Maybe even the entirety of Spider-Man No Way Home will just be an illusion by Mysterio. Like, he thinks he goes to Doctor Strange for help, but that's an illusion as well. So there is a chance that maybe Quentin is still alive and could come back in No Way Home or some future Spider-Man installment or whatever. So I like that everything in that was questionable. And even with Nick Fury being a scroll in this movie, like, I mean, that didn't really need to happen, I guess. But that was just another misleading thing for us to have to think about now. Like, how long has Nick Fury been a scroll in the MCU? Have we ever seen the real Nick Fury? You know, so it was all about illusions and, like, what's real and what's not, and I like that they took that route, because it confused us as well, it left us wondering what we're see if what we're seeing is the truth or not, that's something different and unique that we haven't seen in a Spider-Man movie yet, and I feel that they did that very well. Uh, but let me know what you guys thought of Spider-Man Far From Home down in the comments section, also be sure to like this video and subscribe for more. The next uh, video in this series that I do will be a review of Spider-Man No Way Home, so keep an eye out for that as well. And then following this, at some point, I will be doing a ranking of every live-action Spider-Man movie. But I'll also include Into the Spider-Verse in that, because I really thought that was a really good Spider-Man movie as well. So, thank you for watching this video, everyone, and I'll see you in the next one.